Of all the groups who represent the diversity of humanity in Dune's far-flung future, it is the Fremen and the Sardaukar who perhaps most represent the evolution of mankind, in terms of natural selection, or rather more accurately, in terms of the concept of survival of the fittest. Both groups represent human beings who have gone through considerable trials of hardship where the severity of their lives has led to the development of incredible fighting and survival skills, making them the two diverse groups of humans most to be feared in the Imperium. The Sardaukar are the Emperor Shaddam IV's elite shock troops, feared by virtually everyone in the Imperium, and ultimately the source upon which most of his direct power is reliant within the political triumvirate that rules the known universe. The Emperor, the Spacing Guild, and the Houses of the Landsrad. His dependency upon his legions of Sardaukar is ultimately linked to the power of the Spacing Guild, without whom he is unable to transport his men across the vast distances of the Imperium. With almost all of his legions of Sardaukar on Arrakis at the time of Paul's insurrection, he is left in a critically weak position. The Emperor is only able to survive politically by allowing Paul to engage in a marriage to his daughter Irulan, which will allow him to ascend to the throne, while Shaddam IV retires to Seleucus Secundus with his remaining Sardaukar as a personal bodyguard. Seleucus Secundus is the third planet of the Gamma Wei Ping system, and as a world is greatly significant in understanding not only the development of the Sardaukar in Dune as elite warriors, but also provides a mirror image to both the Fremen as a people and the nature of the world of Arrakis and its ecology. Early in June, Paul asks his Mentat teacher Thufir Howitt if he knows of Seleucus Secundus, stating that it sounds much like Arrakis, perhaps not quite as bad, but much like it. In the appendix of Dune entitled Terminology of the Imperium, we learn that Seleucus Secundus became the capital of the Imperium after House Carino's ascendancy, following the Battle of Corin near Sigma Draconis. Seleucus Secundus is up to a certain point a normal habitable world, but after the use of atomics on the planet, the royal court is transferred to the new capital of Kaitain. From this point on, Seleucus Secundus is barely habitable, with incredibly harsh living conditions, and as such becomes the Imperium's prison planet. In the terminology of the Imperium, it is also noted that Seleucus Secundus was the second stopping point in migrations of the wandering Zen Sunni, and that Fremen tradition says they were slaves on Seleucus Secundus for nine generations. During the visions of other memory whilst undergoing the spice agony, Jessica discovers the transient nature of the Fremen people, who are also referred to in the past as the Zen Sunni wanderers. She notes in her visions that there had been Fremen on Poritrin, she saw, a people grown soft with an easy planet, fair game for imperial raiders to harvest and plant human colonies on Bella Tejus and Seleucus Secundus. One of the mysteries in Dune is the question from where does the Emperor recruit his elite shock troops, the Sardaukar, and why they are such exceptionally tough warriors, almost universally feared by all. The Emperor raises levies from the populations of various worlds, but the major houses of the Landsrad still maintain their own standing military forces. Both members of House Atreides, who see potential allies in the hardened Fremen if the need should arise to fight against the Sardaukar, and House Harkonnen, who are secretly using the Emperor's legions against House Atreides, speculate on the nature of these warriors and their origins. It is Paul's father, the Duke Leto, who is seemingly on the right track as to their origins and training. Despite the fact that speculation on the origins of the Sardaukar and of the Emperor's prison planet Seleucus Secundus are heavily discouraged, Duke Leto has been able to perceive, though not necessarily prove, a connection between the two. It is in the relationship between the harshest of environments of the prison planet and the toughness and ferocity of the Sardaukar wherein he sees such a connection. As Paul notes to his father that Seleucus Secundus is a hell world, Leto replies, undoubtedly, but if you were going to raise tough, strong, ferocious men, what environmental conditions would you impose on them? Despite most people believing that Seleucus Secundus is a hellish prison world, even the Baron Harkonnen commenting to the captured Thufir Howitt 
that the planet is merely a penal colony, and that it is a place where the worst riffraff in the galaxy are sent, few are able to make the connection between the planet and the Emperor's shock troops. Thufur takes a degree of pride in realising that his own duke, now dead, had been able to discern that which the Baron, despite his aptitude for Machiavellian politicking, has not been able to figure out. That conditions on the prison planet are more oppressive than anywhere else, Howitt said. You hear that the mortality rate among new prisoners is higher than 60%. You hear that the Emperor practices every form of oppression there. You hear all this and do not ask questions? The Emperor doesn't permit the Great Houses to inspect his prison, the Baron growled, but he hasn't seen into my dungeons either. And curiosity about Salusa Secundus is. ah, uh, how it put a bony finger to his lips. discouraged? So he's not proud of some of the things he must do there, how it allowed the faintest of smiles to touch his dark lips. His eyes glinted in the glow tube light as he stared at the Baron. And you've never wondered where the Emperor gets his Sardaukar. It is interesting to note that Thufur, albeit too late at this point, understands why the Emperor aided the Baron to help destroy his own cousin, Leto Atreides. The Emperor, albeit sometimes in a weak political position within the narrative of Dune, is still quite powerful because of his Sardaukar. It is the realisation that Leto, who is politically and publicly a popular man within both the population of the Imperium and the political body of the Houses of the Landsrat, may attempt to build an army to rival the Emperor's Sardaukar. Duke Leto knew that Arrakis as a world was every bit as terrible a place as Seleuza Secundus. Knowing this brought the revelation that the Fremen as a people represented a military force that was the potential of a core as strong and deadly as the Sardaukar. It was for this reason, coupled with the wealth that the Spice Melange offered, that House Atreides willingly walked into the trap that awaited them on Arrakis. The Emperor's decision to attack House Atreides alongside the Harkonnens emanates from an inadvertent and seemingly innocent slip of the tongue by the Baron when discussing Arrakis with Sharam IV's agent and friend, Count Hazemir Fenring. He tells the Count that he has the Emperor's prison planet to inspire him in his management of Arrakis, helping to develop a substantial workforce. Fenring curiously questions the Baron further, but is aware that the Baron has not made the connection. The Emperor is aware of House Atreides' actions prior to their takeover of Arrakis in training a small elite force, and his fears are piqued with the understanding of the harsh environmental conditions on Arrakis. The Padishah Emperor turned against House Atreides because the Duke's war masters, Gurney Halleck and Duncan Idaho, had trained a fighting force, a small fighting force to within a hair as good as the Sardaukar, some of them were even better, and the Duke was in a position to enlarge his force to make it every bit as strong as the Emperor's. The Baron weighed this disclosure, then, what has Arrakis to do with this? It provides a pool of recruits already conditioned to the bitterest survival training. The Baron shook his head. You cannot mean the Fremen. I mean the Fremen. The realisation that the harsh environment of Seleucus Secundus, coupled with intense military training and combined with an applied level of mystique and a sense of superiority, eventually leads the Baron to the true nature of the Sardaukar and the sudden realisation that indeed the Fremen represent a fighting force that are seemingly not just their equal, but are in fact far superior. This sudden realisation, and understanding that it was in fact the reason behind the Emperor obliterating House Atreides, brings the Baron Harkonnen to the conclusion that his own house is also in danger from such a threat, and that he will have to sacrifice his nephew Raban, present governor of Arrakis, in order to preserve his own safety and that of his house. The Sardaukar are indeed former prisoners who have survived the terribly harsh environment of Seleucus Secundus and then given the very best of training. They are shaped by their environment, moulded by extreme training, provided with the best equipment, and have their sense of superiority bolstered by their own mystique and membership of a secret and elite cadre. The Sardaukar, when not in direct service to the Emperor, such as being engaged in military activities, 
live what could be considered a soft lifestyle, with Howitt noting that the commonest Sardaukar trooper lives a life, in many respects, as exalted as that of any member of a great house. The Fremen however are a greatly superior fighting force to the Sardaukar. The Fremen view the Sardaukar as being good fighters, and it is interesting to note that apart from the Atreides, most see the Fremen as harmless peasants. The exception to this is the Sardaukar, who after losing a number of engagements to the Fremen, believe that they are a serious threat. When the Baron is told of this by his nephew Raban, he is disbelieving, theorising that the men who engaged the Sardaukar must have been Atreides troops disguised as Fremen. Raban seems to agree with his uncle, but informs him that the Sardaukar already have launched a pogrom to wipe out all Fremen. Apart from living on a planet whose environment can kill an unprotected human very swiftly, the Fremen have very little in common with the Sardaukar. They do have a mystique that settles around them when they escalate their guerrilla war against the Harkonnens under Paul Muad'Dib's leadership. The Fremen are known as the Zen Sunni warriors, a people who have been on the receiving end of forced migrations over thousands of years before they eventually arrived on Arrakis. The Reverend Mother Romalo tells Jessica that they are the people of Mazir, and that since our Sunni ancestors fled from Nilotic al Oruba, we have known flight and death. Herbert based the Fremen heavily on cultures that emanate from desert regions. Their language is heavily influenced by Arabic, and their Zen Sunni religion is a hybrid created out of the combination of Zen Buddhism, Sunni Islam, and Sufism. Although there are other cultural, linguistic, and religious influences used by Herbert to create the Fremen, these have primacy in their makeup. In particular, they seem to be very similar to the Bedouin and the Bushmen of South Africa. The Fremen as a people are completely interconnected to the ecology of Arrakis, adapting their laws, customs, religion, and just about every other aspect of their lives in order to survive on the harsh desert world. Their religion is fundamentally linked to the great sandworms of Arrakis, who they view to an extent as both the creator and adversary from typical monotheistic religions. It is sometimes amusing to consider that the Fremen use their deity as a form of transport, travelling in the deep desert upon the backs of sandworms. Their prized sacred weapons are also related to the sandworms, the deadly knives that they carry being made from the teeth of the gigantic creatures. In addition, their society's goals are focused upon creating a lush, Eden-like world out of the harsh desert planet that is their home, and they are seriously dedicated to this in the long term, knowing that it may take thousands of years. The necessity of conservation of water informs every facet of their culture, from their development of still suits as clothing, to the nature of their value systems. A Fremen's wealth is entirely based on water, which they carry for the good of their tribe. An individual who has no practical use to the Fremen would be viewed in terms of the water in their body, and killed for it. In showing respect or honour, a Fremen may shed a tear, as Paul does for Jamis at his funeral. Upon agreeing to a loose alliance at his first meeting with Duke Leto Atreides, Stilgar spits on the floor to show his sincerity, an action that is very nearly misinterpreted by the Duke's men as an insult. Fremen who live in cities and towns, rather than in the desert, are often derogatorily referred to as being water fat. The Fremen, therefore, are a people that have been totally integrated to the ecological systems of a planet that is considered by the Imperium to be perhaps the single harshest habitable world in the known universe. Their environment has presented them with that simplest of evolutionary choices, adapt or die. The Fremen have adapted with superb efficiency and integrated the knowledge of their world's ecology by necessity into every single facet of their lives. The harshness of their life means too that those no longer useful to the tribe, and unable to look after themselves, are left to the desert, the most common example being the blind. The Fremen are physically notable by their blue within blue within blue eyes, also known as the eyes of Ibad, a result of melange addiction due to the fact that the spice is in their food, water, and the very air that they breathe. 
The Fremen have other physiological changes that have occurred due to their long-term adaption to the environment on Arrakis. In Children of Dune, Leto II, who unlike his father is a true Fremen, observes that from his mother's genes he had that longer, larger, Fremen large intestine to take back water from everything which came its way. In line with their traditions, the Fremen society is organised around a tribal structure with each tribe being based in a siege and led by an individual called a naib, who is often the strongest male individual in the tribe. Fremen customs and law dictate that challenges are made in trial by mortal combat, and the naibs of each tribe are also chosen in this way. Each siege is led religiously by a Sayadina, similar to the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers. Jessica is able to take on the role of Sayadina by undertaking the spice agony and receiving the memories of the previous religious leader of Siege Tabar, the Reverend Mother Ramalo. The Bene Gesserit have seeded myths amongst the Fremen as part of their Missionaria Protectiva, and it is in particular the myth of the Madi that Paul and his mother Jessica are able to take advantage of in becoming accepted by the Fremen. Jessica at first fails to realise the import of the particular myths sown on Arrakis by the Bene Gesserit, thinking that they will be at least useful and the Fremen are beautifully prepared to believe. The Fremen's capabilities as a people are almost superhuman, and although they appear to be anachronistic even by the standards of the feudal imperium, their abilities of technological innovation are often greatly superior to those of other peoples. Their martial technologies do not seem to be particularly advanced, but are eminently suitable to the environment that they fight in. When it comes to technologies based around their environment and water collection and preservation, the Fremen are remarkably ingenious. It is noted for example that Fremen still suits are of greatly superior manufacture and efficiency than those of any other kind. The Fremen and the Sardaukar represent two sides of the same coin, offshoots of humanity that are shaped and adapted by the harshness of their environments. Although the Sardaukar are soldiers who are put through a process of the survival of the fittest on the hellish planet Salusa Secundus, this world is not their normal environment, at least not in the short term, and neither do they remain there. After the Sardaukar's defeat on Arrakis, the remnants retire to Salusa Secundus to become Shaddam IV's bodyguard in exile, ultimately their forces being merged with those of the Fremen before eventually being disbanded by the God Emperor as he creates his fish speaker army. The Fremen however are a product of natural selection and also to a degree eugenics. They have successfully adjusted to their environment to such a degree that they have integrated themselves fully within it and have acquired physical characteristics shaped by their ability to adapt and survive in such a hostile world. The Fremen practice of eugenics is also linked primarily to their survivability on Arrakis, as opposed to the creation of any particular race model. In that sense, their abandonment of the disabled is seen as being for the good of the tribe. Although this bears some similarity to, for example, the practice of exposure of unhealthy children by ancient Greek cultures such as the Spartans, there is no phenotypic selection at work. The blind are left to the desert because their inability to travel stealthily threatens the well-being of the tribe. It also seems that this process is voluntary amongst the Fremen. We can see this when both Paul goes into the desert with his blindness, and also when the Reverend Mother Ramalo passes on her memories to Jessica when she knows that she is too ill to travel. These examples are indicative of both characters acting for the benefit of their community. The Fremen, following the events in Dune, however, are so intrinsically linked to their environment that as the realisation of their long held dream of terraforming Arrakis into an Eden like world progresses, they become water fat to such a degree that their race declines until the point where they are a pitiful semblance of a once great people. Arrakis changes into an environment where the Fremen no longer need to struggle to survive as the deserts of Arrakis decline to such a degree that there are only token patches here and there, they become what are known as Museum Fremen, no longer a force to be reckoned with or even remotely feared, rather more a by-product of tourism for those interested in the ancient history 
of the days of Muad'Dib. Ultimately, the Fremen are indicative of Herbert's conflicting attitudes towards native peoples and Western civilization, and the relationships that humans have with their environment. <laughs>